Will you pray with me? Oh Lord our God, all that we have is yours. You give it to us, you give much to us. Uh, you provide for our needs, you go beyond that to providing for our wants. In many cases, we are incredibly blessed. And uh, we want to be faithful stewards individually as uh, people before you that know that you have spent much for us. You have given everything. You've given your son for us. May we be just as generous as you, in, as you are individually, but then also as, as families and then as a family body, as a body here. May we be good stewards. May we return to you and give to you those things that would be needful for expanding your kingdom here. What you've called us to do is to give, to give generously, to give cheerfully. And so may we do that, and may you use it for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you uh, turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're reading today verses 6 through 15, 6 through 15, and then next week Sunday, we'll look at those last three verses, verses 16, 17, and 18, and our series in First and 2 Thessalonians will conclude. Uh, after that, Mark is going to preach uh, a five or six week sermon series leading up to our fall sermon series. So, uh, the next several weeks, Mark will be leading us in uh, the teaching of the Word. Uh, today, tomorrow, you get me uh, and then Mark. So you have much to look forward to. As we uh, read today, let's, uh, let's give our attention to God's Word. This is His inspired Word. It is infallible. That means that it doesn't fall apart. When you put some stress on it, when you put some attention to it. You start looking at God's Word in a much more significant and serious manner. It does not fall apart. It remains whole. It's united from beginning to end. One central theme pointing us over and over again to Jesus Christ. And so the Scriptures are infallible. They're also without error. And uh, so let's read them. This is, uh, this is the only place, uh, this is the only place you're going to get that. Word without error. Word that does not fall apart. So it's, it's due our reverence. Let's read this together this morning. Second uh, Thessalonians 3, beginning at verse 6. I'll read. You can follow along in your Bibles or on your apps. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work... Let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your word. It is indeed sharper than a two-edged sword. It, it cuts. It cuts to divide soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It, it cuts to our hearts. It exposes the thoughts and inclinations and intentions of our hearts. Thank you, O oh God, for your word that does this, that exposes our sin so that it can be healed, that it can be forgiven, that we can be changed. Lord, do this work this morning 
uh, do surgery upon us, remove from us the, our malignancies, our tendency towards sin, our tendency to rebel, uh, shape us, mold us, fashion us in, in the healing from this surgery into Christ-like people, that we would follow our Savior, that we would obey His commands, that we would love Him, love you, love one another. All for the sake of your kingdom, Lord. This is what your kingdom is called to. This is what we're called to as gospel, your gospel-shaped community. Teach us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, every so often, uh, as cir- uh, circumstances would dictate it, um, my mom would drop this little nugget on me, this little bit of wisdom she would say to me, idle hands, Phil, are the devil's workshop. Like she was trying to get me to do something, right? Trying to get me to work. Uh, it didn't really have the desired effect that she had. I was, uh, this was when I was in high school. I, I pretty much did what I was going to do and was lazy and a bum. And actually, Shelly still has to deal with that quite a bit, uh, if I'm honest. Uh, it's, but uh, So after reading this passage, this passage is heavy on uh, idle, being idle, being, being undisciplined. Uh, and so after reading this, you might think that this passage was the origin of that, of that adage. Uh, the the uh, idle hands are devil's workshop adage. But I don't think it is. I think there are other places we might find uh, that are the... The origin of this statement, for instance, uh, Proverbs has a couple of um, Proverbs that could be used to uh, form this kind of adage, like verse 27 of chapter 16, Proverbs 16, 27. A worthless man plots evil and his speech is like, his speech is like a scorching fire. A worthless man plots evil. Uh, Idle hands turn to evil. Um, even that word worthless, it's actually the word Belial, which is another name for Satan. So there's, a, there's some connections here to this, from this proverb, Proverbs 16, 27, uh, that lead us to maybe think about this adage. An idle man has too much time on his hands and thinks of ways to get up to no good. Uh, this uh, adage uh, also comes in another form. Perhaps you've put, heard this adage put this way, that idle hands are the devil's playground. Have you heard that one? Have you heard it put like that? Um, imagine for a moment, and this is, uh, this is not original with me. I, I read this in a John Stott commentary, and I'm just going to update it a little bit. Uh, but he, he helps us with this idea of what this idea of the devil's playground might be like. He says, imagine for a moment that you, you show up at Disneyland only to find out that you're, you're the only people there. It's wide open to you. Every ride is available. All the best rides. Space Mountain. Star Wars Land. The Haunted Mansion. All the old classics. Dumbo, Peter Pan. They're all, they're all yours. You can ride them as many times as you want. No lines, no waiting. Over and over again. It doesn't look like that even matters to you guys. That's my dream. I mean, that's, I would just, isn't that something? Oh, I think it's awesome. But here's, here's what Stott said. Stott said uh, that in the same way, uh, when the devil comes to play in the mind of someone who is idle, someone who is undisciplined, he finds no lines. He finds no weight, no interruptions. He has free reign. Easy peasy for the devil to get us distracted, for the devil to take us away from what God would have us do. He says to us, come and play. Come and play with me. Let me play with you. Let's play together. Let's let's be undisciplined. Let's do what we want. Uh, In the Pilgrim's Progress, we, we read of sloth, who uh, is, uh, along with two other friends, simple and uh, presumption, and they're found sleeping with chains on their ankles. 
as Christian encounters them, and he tries to waken them, he tries to warn them of the dangers that they face, but sloth prefer, prefers to uh, sleep in, to sleep just a little bit longer, illustrating his lack of concern for his spiritual well-being. Later on, Christiana comes along these three also, but finds that they're dead, finds them hanging due to their misdeeds. So Paul in this letter, what, what is Paul doing? As he, as he writes this section on idleness, it's, it's the second largest section in his two letters. He focuses on this quite a bit, this idea of idleness. And yet what I think he's really doing, if you, if you think about the, the context of this letter, here he is, he, he's likely in Corinth. He's writing a letter to the Thessalonians. He's, um, this is his first letter, first couple of letters to the church. And I believe uh, he's still working out his, his theology of discipline. What does the Bible say about church discipline? How are we to act toward each other? So he says, and, and this is our main point this morning, this is what Paul's after Uh, that God's gospel-shaped community resting in the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ is busy at work, disciplined, that we have discipline to our lives. Now, Paul has just said in verses 4 and 5 that he's confident that the Thessalonians are doing and will do what he's commanded. So this topic of idleness is the issue that Paul addresses here But it's really, I think, the beginning of his working out of what does church discipline look like. And so when I say those words, church discipline, I imagine that different ones of you have different ideas about what I'm talking about or different experiences with church discipline from past churches. So what is church discipline all about? Well, it is for the glory of God. It is for the purity of the church And it is for the restoration of the sinner, of the repentant sinner, that a a sinner who is caught in sin, made knowledgeable of his sin, disciplined, is eager to come back to Christ, eager to follow Jesus. That's what church discipline is all about. It's about making disciples. It's about making disciples that, that love the Lord and want to obey him. That's what church discipline is all about. Uh, di- disciples are disciplined people. Or better yet, people growing in discipline. Right? We're people growing in discipline. Busy at work. Uh, if you've not read a good book on the spiritual disciplines in a while, or perhaps ever, uh, pick one up by Jerry Bridges. He's got several that speak to this idea of living a disciplined life. The pursuit of holiness. Uh, is the one that I that had a huge impact on me when I was when I was young before I was married. Um, we often, uh, however, also forget that there's two sides to church discipline. Um, our our constitution, the the Presbyterian Church in America, has a constitution made up of the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Book of Church Order. And as those who hold to these. These are documents that you can make use of. So the Book of Church Order speaks to this whole idea of church discipline. And in that, in its section on uh, the beginning chapter on church discipline, it reminds us of this, that there are two sides to church discipline. It has two senses. The one referring to the whole government, inspection, training, guardianship, and control which the church maintains over its members, its officers, and its courts. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, so here's what it means. The, the, there's one sense of church discipline that is happening right now. As we sit in worship, think about what we did in worship today. We, we've already recited scripture together. We've recited uh, the catechism together, so we're catechizing each other. We've sung truths about God to each other and to God. Uh, we are hearing the preaching of the word right now, sitting under the preaching of the word, sitting and receiving and participating in the sacrament. All of these are disciplines, being discipled, being 
being taught what is right and true about what it means to be a Christian. When you go to a Bible study, when you go to life group, when you do your personal devotions, you are gaining discipline. You are being discipled, right? So discipline, discipleship, there, there is a positive sense to church discipline. The church exercises discipline as the elders work out what it means that is best for you to do as a body. So we arrange the worship service, and we arrange it in a manner that we think is best to reflect the way that God works through covenants with his people. So we do a worship service that's called covenant renewal. That's what's going on in our worship service. We're renewing our covenant with God. Our discipleship hour disciples us in various truths concerning God. So there's this positive side, and then there's the other side that we, can, we often think of when we think of church discipline, the, what we might call the penal side, right? The penalty, the, the active work of the church when it exercises censures that help people understand their sin, the seriousness of their sin, and how they can be restored from their sin to relationship again. So we have these two senses, and we engage in these all the time in worship. That's what we're about when we're in worship, when we're together as a church. And then we have this part of uh, discipline that is uh, corrective, right? That we're bringing correction. We're helping someone learn uh, how to come back from their sin. And so what Paul's doing here in this passage is he's, he's working this out, and he begins with this sin of idleness or living an undisciplined life and he's basically saying you need more discipline if you lack discipline work on being more disciplined in your christian walk now some in the church in thessalonica had misunderstood paul's instruction about the return of christ and so that was why some of the folks in in uh Thessalonica were struggling with this idleness. They thought Jesus was going to return very soon, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps uh, next week, and so they stopped everything. They put life on hold. They said, let's just sit and wait and be ready. And, and we can understand that. We can understand why they might have done that, but Paul says, no, that's not the way we're to wait for the Lord's return. And we don't know when his return is, so every day must be an active waiting. We must be busy at work, doing the work that God has called us to. Now, there were others in the church in Thessalonica who had probably gotten caught up in the, the current um, uh, fad, uh, although it was probably centuries old. I don't know if you can say that about fads, but uh, this idea of sitting under the, the care of a benefactor someone who was rich, they would gather followers. They would pay for people to, to live with them or to live certain ways, and they would be their disciples or their entourage, right? They're, they're groupies. And if you were a groupie of this teacher, you would rest upon his kindness, his generosity for all that you needed. So you were idle. You didn't do anything. And you just simply were resting on what he could do for you, this sponsor. So Paul gets to the heart of his instruction in verse 11. Uh, this, I think, is really what he's aiming at. This is where he exposes the central sin for the church in Thessalonica. He says, we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Some of you... Some of you walk in idleness. Some of you live undisciplined lives. Some of you are not walking the walk of diligence and work. Instead, you're busying yourselves in other people's lives. Busy bodies. Now, hearing that might be a hard pill to swallow. And if it is, look to the living water, Jesus Christ, to help you get that pill down. Because Jesus is the one who calls you to this kind of obedience, to looking out for others' interests above your own. So you may be idle, you may be living a life of idle, idleness, or, 
Or more likely, perhaps, you live what, uh, what I'm just going to call seasonal idleness, seasonal undisciplined lives. Like, uh, <clears throat> maybe I should move this way and talk this way to this folks, the, this set of folks, because you're, you're less disciplined. No, I'm not going to say that. No, but you've got, we've got more kids over here per capita, right? Than the, so you guys, you guys long for, you long for these times where you can live an undisciplined hour, right? <laughs> Away from the, where the kids are taken care of, they're asleep, and you finally have your time. Or you go on vacation because we need, we need this break. Or you've been looking at it all your life, and you got to that age, and you can say, okay, I'm ready to go. Retirement is here. Whatever the case is, when we need, when we say we need that break so badly, well, that's just as much a result of a lack of discipline as living an undisciplined life is. Filling your lives, filling your schedules, hear this, parents, filling your schedules, filling your children's schedules with nonstop activity is a lack of of discipline. If you go through that nonstop activity, waiting and longing for this break where I'm finally, the kids are out of the house, I'm an empty nester, or the kids are at camp, or the kids are asleep, or the kids are, it's because you've filled your time too much. Discipline, acting in a disciplined way is a way that God wants you to live that's healthy for you. No matter what your age is, no matter what your stage of life is, that you live a disciplined life so that when you get to the break, it is a break, and you can just rest through the break and then come back to a a not so busy schedule, a not so rushed schedule, a not so full schedule. Seasonal idleness. Um, you know, uh, Sir Isaac Newton came up with these three laws, discovered these three laws of motion. Uh, The first of these laws states that an object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion at a constant speed and in, in a straight line unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So applying this law to the idle or to the undisciplined, we can say a person at rest will remain at rest until he's kicked in the backside by an un, uh, by a, he, until he's acted on with a swift kick. We need, we need this little kick. We need this encouragement. And so, so Paul here in this passage, he gives us some instruction. So finally, we're going to get to the passage. Keep away from the idle brother. That's the first thing he says, this first warning, this first way of helping an idle brother become more disciplined is to keep away from him. That sounds a little counterintuitive. But let's read this a little bit. Let's, uh, so the, the passage is bookended. I don't know if you caught that. It's bookended by these statements about staying away, keeping away. All right, so verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. And then moving down to verse 13. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So the commands that are given throughout this passage are commands that are meant for us to walk uh, in a manner that's not idle, a manner that's busy, a manner that's busy in a healthy way. Uh, This idea of keeping away from, keeping away from, Uh, It means that we're really, we're not to get mixed up with those who are engaging in in an undisciplined life, that we're not to get mixed up with them because doing what they do when they're doing it, when, when they're being lazy, when they're being undisciplined, we will catch it, right? It is contagious. Paul says, uh, what does he say? What's the verse? Um, now I've lost it. Uh, Bad company ruins good morals. 
And that's, that is in the Bible. You know, you have lots of phrases. You wonder, was that really in the Bible or is that something someone made up? That one's in the Bible. Bad company ruins good morals. If you hang around with people who are being lazy, you're going to be lazy. If you're hanging around with people who are undisciplined, you're going to become undisciplined. But notice that Paul addresses this to brothers. He does say brothers three times in this passage. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. This, this is what he's after. So he's, he's uh, giving instruction here to brothers and sisters who are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are in Christ. They are part of the family. They're not meant to be treated as unbelievers. Now, Paul does give strong instruction elsewhere of a similar sort, right? So we're going to look briefly at 1 Corinthians 5. We're going to look at this other passage where he does give stronger language than what he gives here in 2 Thessalonians. So in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, beginning at verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with And so that word, not to associate, it's the exact same words, don't have anything to do with or have nothing to do with. Do not associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you to not associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunk, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church from whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So several things we can talk about here regarding this passage, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here with 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, It's clear that we are to judge those in the church, those that bear the name of Christ, those that would call themselves Christians. It is fair and it's appropriate that we would open ourselves up to being judged. We should expect to be judged, that our actions would be looked at for whether they are the right kind of fruit, right? If we're bearing fruit that's righteous, that should be evident. If we're bearing fruit that, that shows a, a corrupt heart, that should be evident as well. That should be judged, and we should be brought up uh, short by others in our lives when they see those things. The sins in this list uh, do have a, a great effect, don't they? They are, they are heinous. Uh, they are also then subject to greater discipline. This passage that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 5 tells us that there are some sins that are more heinous than others. The effects of these sins are greater on the people around them than other sins and must be treated accordingly. So, accordingly. so in, in this passage... Uh, we have this list of sexual immorality, greed, idolater, reviled, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Uh, we're not to associate with them. And then he goes on and says, or even have a meal with them. And then he says, to purge that person from among you. Now, again, our constitution or our confession helps us with language to talk about this, to use here. Uh, So when you encounter uh, an issue in life, pick up your Westminster Confession of Faith. See what it has to say about that particular issue. Uh, It is in the back of the Trinity Hymnal, which we have out in the the narthex. Uh, If you don't have a Trinity Hymnal and you need one and you want the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Shorter Catechism, just pick one up. Take it home with you. Okay? Use that, but use it in your life. Use the confessions, use the, our, our constitution to help inform the way that you're thinking, looking. We believe they're good summaries of what the Bible teaches. So in the, in the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, there's a really clear um, table of contents. So just go to your confession, look for where it says church discipline. Now, it doesn't say that in the confession, sorry. Uh, it says church censures. 
So you just kind of have to know what to look for. You could look in conjunction with this passage. Maybe you're interested in excommunication. Well, it doesn't really speak about that as a title either, but it's under that church censures chapter. So look that up. Here's what it says. It says that we ought to be judged, we ought to be uh, and, and treated in such a manner that the result would be our repentance and that that best comes around as we're taught from the Scriptures, as we uh, hear from the Scriptures what we ought to do. And that there is a, uh, a phrase in there, according to the nature of the crime, the nature of the sin that we commit. So harsher sins and more heinous sins, sins that have a greater effect, must be stopped, must be treated more harshly, more, more strongly. It's probably a better word. Um, there is a difference. Jesus says in, in his Sermon on the Mount, uh, you have heard it said, do not murder. Well, I tell you that if you have hatred in your heart for another, you have already murdered. Now, so we have two sins there, both worthy of God's judgment and worthy of death, whether it's hatred toward the brother or murder. Both of those are worthy of death. Neither one of those sins allows us to get away, to get off. Even though the, the hatred in our heart or in our mind is, is not even seen by anyone else, God sees it, God knows it. The, the way that we would treat them, however, there is a difference with murder, isn't there? Someone's life is actually taken. There is a stronger discipline given for someone who commits murder than for someone who hates his brother. If he continues in that hatred, we know that what Jesus is saying, it will end up, could end up in physical murder. So we're to, we're to treat both. We're to administer discipline in both situations. But here, he says, with, the, with these sins in 1 Corinthians 5, we're to not associate with them. We're not to eat with them. We're not to allow them to remain in the fellowship. We're to purge them. The person who's being idle, we don't hang out with them when they're being idle, but we invite them to work. We invite them to serve. We invite them to our house to see what it looks like to live in a household that is a working household. We want them in our lives, but we're not going to associate with them when they're just being lazy. We're not going to give them right, the, the, the pleasure of our, of our um, presence with them. We're going to remove our presence that they would feel that and change their ways. So different sins, different strengths of discipline, different manners of discipline, all of that requiring great wisdom, right? This whole idea of purging someone from the congregation, excommunicating them, that is a long process that's a careful process done by the church. But we do these things in order to help each other live disciplined lives. So brothers and sisters, walking together in discipline. And then again, we know that this uh, is like bookending this passage, this idea of not doing anything or not being with them, um, not associating with those who are idle or undisciplined. You, you remember from Psalm 1, uh, David begins by writing right from the beginning, blessed is the man, happy is the man, some versions say. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, who does not stand in the way of sinners, who does not sit with mockers or scorners. So the, the man who's blessed, the man is happy, has nothing to do with those who are not listening to godly counsel, who are scoffing at God, who are rejecting God. When we act in this way, when we care for one another by acting, by talking through these things and by acting on them, we are actually loving them, right? We want to love people by being difficult or hard on them at times, making, making, helping them make the choices that are best for them. So Paul moves on then. We're going to move on as well uh, 
to the second thing Paul does. So the first thing he does to help those who are idle or undisciplined is says, stay away from them. Don't, don't interact with them while they're being undisciplined. But then we're also to uh, present to them a, an example, just as Paul did, that they have an example to imitate, an example worthy of imitation. Paul says in verses 7 through 10, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So Paul set the example. He and his companions were not idle when they were in Thessalonica. They did not eat anybody's bread without paying for it. And with toil and labor, they worked day and night. You remember that Paul was a, a tent maker, right? So he set, up, he set up outside of Thessalonica where all the tents were. So you imagine these ancient cities, uh, the downtown section, the, uh, the, the, where the uh, uh, people were selling their goods might have had some stone structures, some stone buildings, maybe two stories high, maybe at that point three stories high, but probably two stories where they lived above their shop. They would have these, uh, you know, through the main street of town, maybe a few of these stone buildings. But then from there, as it spread out into the, um, into the suburbs, into the other parts of the town or the city, more and more, you'd see more and more tents. Maybe richer folks with their stone houses and so forth, but more, more people living in tents. That's what Paul made his money off of. He made tents for people. And I think uh, this is not anything I got from any commentary. I'm just uh, extrapolating that toil and labor. Toil was, was building the tents and the labor was selling them. That's, that's my guess, that he had a little shop where he set up shop and he sold his tents. But he worked night and day, he says, sunrise to sunset. He worked. He toiled in their midst. And as a, as a shopkeeper, as one who labored, yeah, sure, he had those times where uh, business wasn't great. He maybe took an afternoon nap while he waited for the next customer to come up to his, his little shop. Uh, but he worked. He worked regularly. He set that example. They were not a burden to anyone. And as an apostle... He didn't have to work. He could have demanded from the, from the congregation that they keep him, that they take care of him, that they give him. He could have made these demands. He says, I could have done that, but I didn't. I worked. I worked in front of you. And his example is to be imitated, literally, literally mimicked. That's the word in, in the Greek. It, it's, it's the root word we get mimic from. And uh, this past week when we were out uh, with the grandkids, it was, uh, it was fun to hear my little one-year-old granddaughter imitate what the doggy says. Woof. Oof. She didn't really say the W. She just said, oof. Little one-year-old Lou uh, saying, just mimicking, right? That's part of what we grow up with. The other boys, the, the twin boys that are five, uh, they like doing the thing that we do sometimes um, uh, where you repeat, you mimic what the other person said just to kind of annoy them, like, are you having fun? Are you having fun? Are you repeating after me? Are you repeating after me? Stop repeating after me. Stop repeating after me. Of course, I didn't get involved in any of that. That was just them. But that mimicry, that watching, even Shelly will say, she thinks that we, mimic, we mimicked our father in the way that we walked, that all the cruise boys walked the same way. We imitated that. I, I don't think we did it on purpose. Uh, but we do all walk the same. Uh, mimicking, imitating, right? They say it's the highest form of flattery. So, so pick the right examples. Pick the right people to imitate. Don't imitate. Paul says stay away from those. Stay away from those that are doing, living an undisciplined life. Stay away from those that are, that are idle. But mix it up with follow the imitation. Follow the example, imitate the example of those that are doing the right thing, that are working hard. Join them in that work. Live under Christ's authority. Uh, consider, consider for a moment your, uh, your work habits. 
or perhaps uh, your idol habits. Uh, who are you following? Whose example? Can you think back? Like, what were your parents like? What was the ethic, the work ethic your parents gave you? Like much of what we learn as we grow up, it's learning in our homes, it's learning from our parents that we learn the most. So was your dad or your grandfather a hard worker? Was mom a hard worker in the home? Did she work outside the home? Who are you imitating? Who are your children going to imitate? Who are your grandchildren imitating? What do they see when they see you? Or what do they hear when they hear you talk about work? So, an, uh, an example to imitate. And then he gives one more ins- bit of instruction in verse 12. And this one is direct. This is very direct to the people who are idle. Encourage and command the idle in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. And that's what we're to do as the body of Christ, is to urge and encourage those who are not working, who are idle, to work, to be active in work. Now, um, we ought not to skip over too quickly the fact that Paul uses here the entire title of Jesus Christ. He refers here, when he says this, in the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. So Paul uses his title, Lord, and he uses his uh, role as Messiah, the Christ. Christ is not his last name. It's also a title, right? So, uh, and to all of this, Lord and Messiah, to underscore the Lord's authority and his mission, to underscore his authority and his mission, that as those who are under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to be active. We're to be busy at work. We are to encourage those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ to do the same, to be active in their work, to not be slothful, to not just sit around, to not be lazy, but to be active. So coming under His authority, we obey, joining Him in His mission in the world, We are encouraged to be active in gospel proclamation. In this way, our work pleases Him and provides the occasion for us as a faithful people to live together in community. All right, so lots of things we cover today. It's a big topic, uh, this idea of idleness or undisciplined life. The ideas of work, what is work? And that's a whole other set of sermons we could have on What is work and how do we work correctly, rightly before God? I'm sure this has led to some questions in your mind, like what kind of work should we be busy at? Uh, I would just say be disciplined in whatever work God calls you to. Uh, What about those who are workaholics and work too much to the detriment of others? So that's another great topic. That'd be another good sermon, right? Uh, I won't tell you ahead of time when I'm preaching that because you won't show up. Because I'm, I'm sure that there's more of an issue with that in this body than it is idleness. Workaholics. Working too much. Going back to that idea of overscheduling your schedule, overfilling your schedule. Are you exercising discipline in your work habits? Too much work is, can be a detriment. What if you're working, but it's a weary, difficult job? Work as unto the Lord. Work as unto the Lord. Seek what the Lord would have you do in the midst of that. What if you want to work, but you can't? What if you're hindered in your ability to work? So lots of questions. I can't address them all today. They're good things for you to think about. If you have questions about them, the elders are always eager to talk about these things with you. But let's remember, finally, uh, the Lord's work on our behalf. So we come to the table in just a moment. And what we celebrate as we come to the table is the Lord Jesus' completed work on our behalf. You see, our our Lord, being 
those who are working together in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to follow his example, which was complete. Complete obedience, never disregarding the Father's will. Always, at every turn, fulfilling the Father's will. Work. He worked. He, 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 he was obedient. He was obedient to every single command. That's work. You and I know how hard it is when we work at trying to overcome those besetting sins in our lives. We know how hard it is because they're like a whack-a-mole, right? We, we, we feel like we finally got control of this one and another one pops up. We feel like, oh, okay, I need to spend more time on that. And I, that, then another one pops up. And we're just going after these sins in our lives. And, and how, much, how hard a work it is to feel like we finally just, we've got some, made some headway on this particular sin. But Jesus, I think we feel like it was easy for him. It was work for him to keep from sinning. He worked. Obedience is hard. And then he went to the cross, completing his work. Never idle, never giving up, never stopping. He worked on our behalf. So we work in him. We work with him. We are disciplined because of his discipline. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we need these words. We need this help. We need your help daily to be able to live lives that are pleasing to you. Thank you that you are so, so receptive to your children who are disobedient to you over and over. Your patience is so long-suffering. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. Son, for coming to redeem us. Spirit, for working in us. May we now work in uh, our lives to be pleasing before you. Help us now as we come to your table to focus our minds and hearts.